Well, good afternoon, everyone. It is 1 o'clock, so we are going to get started with our next breakout session, which is the design and control of concrete mixtures. With us today, we're very grateful to have not only the author of this book, but also the queen of concrete, Michelle Wilson from the Portland Cement Association. Uh, I've gotten to know Michelle over the past few years, and one of the things I really like about this industry is just the quality and caliber of people that you get to meet and interact with. And so I think if you've never uh, seen Michelle present before, you're in for a real treat. She is extremely knowledgeable. Uh, we're grateful to have her here. And what's interesting and a fun fact about Michelle is that up until five months ago, she had never been to North Dakota. Um, but she had a, had a goal, a quest, if you will, of reaching all 50 states before a certain milestone birthday. I mean, 50 states by the time you're 30 is pretty good, Michelle. Um, so she, uh, she flew in, in in November and spent a weekend in Fargo, uh, got to be a local celebrity at the Fargo Convention and Visitors Bureau where they gave her a T-shirt and took her picture, and she's now part of the North Dakota Best for Last Club, which is an actual thing for people that hit all 50 states and save North Dakota for last. So we are uh, excited to bring Michelle into Bismarck, and with that, I will end the introduction and let her uh, take over on the presentation. Please welcome Michelle. bonding with you up here without knowing. So by a show of hands, who are my DOT? Don't be shy about what you do. You're all here for a reason. Okay, uh, what about municipalities? Very good. How about consultants? Oh, look at you guys making all the money. Um, how, about, uh, how about producers? Got any producers in the room? Very good. Uh, who would I leave out? Testing labs? Any testing labs? Anybody I've forgotten that feels neglected? Oh, we do have contra contractors here too. Um, that's great. One, one hiding in the corner. All right, now, most, couple of more. Most importantly, who has a copy, and it's okay if it's 20 years old, who has a copy of the Design and Control of Concrete Mixtures? Oh, you got the rest of you are hurting my feelings, and it's not about me. I don't, I don't make a commodity over this or any type of profit. Uh, I have salary, I work for a non-profit association, and, but PCA, and the design and control has been around a lot longer than my 30 years, <clears throat> give or take a decade or two. Um, so I do hope that you're aware of this book. And if you're not, I'd like to uh, introduce you to it today and talk about some of its major technical updates that would be important to you in the concrete industry and successful paving. Uh, so the, for those of you who don't know PCA, we're a trade association that represents the cement manufacturers in North America. And uh, I happen to be their concrete girl, and it's a self-entitled uh, name of Concrete Queen, but it's been a long quest. Um, my real job at PCA is our Senior Director of Concrete Industry Outreach and Support, which sounds like an HR term, but uh, I didn't give myself that title. They won't call me Concrete Queen on my business card. My whole goal is not to sell you a bag of cement or even a book. You should have the book, but I don't need to sell it to you. Uh, my goal is that concrete turns out. And, and all I want is for concrete to turn out. And when it doesn't, I get sad. And I get disappointed in the things that we have done wrong that we know how to do right. So uh, we don't need to cut corners. We do need to have some performance. But it's up to us as to what we're asking for. So <clears throat> good is subjective. And what's good to me may or may not be good to your owners and your communities. So we're going to discuss a few things, firstly. I want to introduce you to the evolution of design and control. It's been over almost 100 years, not quite. Um, but also, I want to really get into some of the technical updates in the manual. So I wasn't around uh, for the first uh, edition at PCA. Uh, PCA has been around for over 100 years, since 1916. But uh, who are my concrete nerds in the room? And it's OK if it's not all of you. I mean, I'm proud to raise my hand to this. OK. Have you heard of Duff Abrams? Have you heard of the slump cone? Have you heard of the water cement ratio? Have you heard of bulk volume of aggregates and the absolute volume mix design method? That's all duff. 
and the Lewis Institute, which was originally PCA's uh, first research lab in downtown Chicago. So Duff back in 1918 did something for the concrete industry that you may or may not be aware of. Prior to 1918, we designed concrete in a certain way, even the Romans did it this way. We said, you know, three scoops of sand, two scoops of coarse, and one scoop of cement would be just fine. And then we add enough water to get her done. And that's how we did it. And some of us still do that, whether it's residential concrete or other types. And that is how we make a lot of other things by volume. It's not really the best practice for a mixed design. What we want to make is a cubic yard, or if you live further north, maybe a cubic meter. And uh, we want it to fit within a relationship that gives us compressive strength that gives us performance, which is usually more than strength. It's usually durability. And in a climate like this, we need freeze-thaw protection. You may have reactive rocks, and you may be designing for ASR, which is alkali silica reactivity. You may be designing for other parameters like low shrinkage. All of those things can be done, and Duff knew about them um, and didn't necessarily know how to prevent ASR, but he knew a lot back in the early 1920s. And PCA took that information and evolved it into the design and control of concrete mixtures in 1924. So the first bulletin came out in 1924. I did not write that one. Um, <clears throat> and it uh, happened to be specifically on mixed design. And as it evolved over the years, in the 50s is where they produced uh, the 10th edition as it grew. And really why the 50s was so huge was because of exactly what you heard about at lunchtime. Uh, the Transportation Act, the infrastructure, the Eisenhower bills, all of that really played a role in huge concrete paving around the United States. And with that came a lot of research at PCA as well as with the Bureau and the Corps. And all those nerds sat around tables and wrote each other letters about concrete durability and they talked about testing parameters for concrete that included things like the air test, that included things like freeze-thaw, um, and other things that we do now regularly to make concrete performance. So as we continued um, <clears throat> in the 60s, we started adding in some interesting admixture technology, and so the book evolved to include uh, specialty admixtures, whether those were um, simple water reducers or retarders or accelerators, because air has been around since the 50s. And we also built a lot more with lightweight concrete and other specialties, so that helped it grow. And then in the 70s and 80s was when we started designing high-rises. Um, using super plasticizers and other technology and getting our strengths of concrete well above 5,000 psi, now suddenly making 18,000 psi concrete and doing it on a regular basis. So this really became the book in the late 80s. This was my book in college when I was, you know, really young. Um, and uh, my book was brown for 20 years. And some of you may still have that book on your shelves, and that's okay, except Materials have changed, testing parameters have changed, and specifications have changed, and we have to evolve with that change. Concrete's still concrete, but the standards evolve, so we, we want to keep up with the technology and let everyone else know that our industry is highly technical and somewhat astute, and, and we can make concrete that turns out. So in the early 2000s was our first color edition, in case you don't like black and white. But it also had things like supplementary cementitious materials in it. It had uh, high performance concrete well above the 5,000 in the 8,000s and 10,000s. And a lot of other information such as fiber reinforcement. Um, I started uh, at PCA in 1999 when obviously I must have been about 11. Um, and. Uh, I worked on this edition, but I was not a primary author. Um, the first edition that I helped author was uh, in 2011. And that book, we focused on the topic of sustainability. Our industry really needs to hone in on that. We'll talk more about that later this afternoon when we talk about uh, supplementary cementitious materials in further detail and Portland limestone cements. But <clears throat> this book really honed in on sustainability and uh, durability, which are two topics that are unfortunately neglected in our industry. And then um, <clears throat> also got into uh, some other very important things in uh, the, what we call the 16th edition. That was our centennial anniversary, so we had to update standards anyway, but it was good to produce a book, and it's just a coincidence that the 16th edition was in 2016. 
that's purely coincidental. Um, but really, one of the fun things that's in that book, if you have it on your shelf, is a timeline of uh, many contributions of concrete over the history and with DOTs having significant impact on those technical advancements and requirements, um, that plays a huge role. But let's talk about the new one um, and really why we update this book. The real reason we update this book is because standards change and because our material requirements change. So the new chapters on imperfections and innovations are, are important to us. Uh, imperfections is a topic that unfortunately we have to address. Uh, sometimes concrete cracks, not in every truck, by the way. Um, and sometimes we do have uh, a need to talk about further advancement, like concrete on the moon, or uh, ductile concrete, or see-through concrete, or smog-eating concrete, and all those things. So they're in the book, too. Um, but really, the book is a basics, fundamentals, all the way to advanced learning manual that if you read it from front to back, you're going to really need a few lunch breaks and dinner breaks. It's meant to be a resource for you to look up your question. And so between the table of contents and the index, you should get your questions answered in writing. That's what I'm here for. If you don't have your ability in the concrete industry to answer your question in writing, then, then we're not doing you a service. And so this book has several chapters on materials, obviously on cement, but on every other material. And for those of you who didn't wake up this morning thinking about ASTM C33, because you're AASHTO people, but uh, um, so uh, it's standard changed. It actually allows recycled materials in higher volumes. Um, it's opening the door for other specifications to use less than um, perfect materials. So we do use reactive rock in concrete. We don't want you to use reactive carbonate rock, but we always uh, have used silicious materials that can break down because we know how to prevent that reaction. We do use recycled materials for sustainability purposes, but also because it's convenient. If you're breaking up a roadway, why not use that material in your next mixture if it doesn't hurt the performance of your concrete? Um, so those things are, are huge changes to us. Also, um, the properties of concrete are a huge change. We, we do cover the fundamentals in Chapter 9, but when, it, when we get into things like lower shrinkage tolerances, uh, early age shrinkage performance requirements, such as the PEM tests that were talked about earlier today, the ring test and such, that's all in Chapter 10. Um, any uh, continued durability testing, changes in ASR mitigation, uh, that's all in Chapter 11. And then Chapter 12 got a huge overhaul with PCA's roadmap to carbon neutrality in 2050, which I'll talk a little bit more about um, this afternoon, but really an important venture for our industry to acknowledge the footprint that concrete makes and cement plays a role in, uh, but how it can actually be a very resilient sustainable material if you take it from cradle to grave and look at its entire life cycle. And then um, <clears throat> I'm partial to a few other topics. I chair the committee on ASTM C94, so ready mix concrete's very important to us. Well, that spec basically just tells you to mix some concrete up and deliver it. Um, so you need to look at other standards uh, as well for producing the quality concrete that an owner might need, and it's all up to the owner to know what they actually need versus what they think they want. And so when it comes to batching concrete and handling it, there's many different ways to get that done. And we'll get into, as well, um, placing and finishing roles. This isn't meant to train a finisher. It's actually meant more to train an engineer on what the finisher has to do. Um, we have other uh, wonderful industry resources on placing and finishing. Um, and then that guide on imperfections, that came from an old PCA uh, product that was very useful to contractors and other industry that needed to talk about things like bug holes and such. And so that's uh, now a new chapter in design and control. And then lastly, we get into the performance of concrete under different environments, including hot and cold weather, um, obviously paving and structures being our main applications, and testing methods being way more than the slump cone. Um, obviously, there are performance requirements that are pre-approved for concrete mixtures, and then every once in a while, we make you go through extra hurdles in the field as well. And then uh, 
<clears throat> we did revamp the high performance concrete to really add in some current case studies, some excellent examples of concrete in use uh, that has been designed for high performance that is well above just strength. And then I've already mentioned innovations, uh, which is a specialty topic. One of the things about the design and control that you should be aware of is that it's um, based on standards. So if you're dealing with any of these standards, uh, whether you're AASHTO driven or ASTM or you like harmonized standards, all of these are written in mandatory language to put you to sleep. Um, but really what they're asking for is minimum bar. They're, they're a C grade of a spec. They're saying this is usable. Now ask the owner what they really want and make sure that that's in the contract documents, in the specification. Another organization that I work very closely with is ACI, and uh, their default documents are meant to be industry guides for you, but they've been updated over the years. So ACI 301 is the standard specification for structural concrete. It's a default. Does it work for paving? It has. It's been a default in many paving specs. Um, it's actually meant more for commercial construction and follows ACI 318. And that code, which is adopted by ICC usually, is something that many state DOTs in the Federal Highway Administration also looks at for things like exposure classifications. We use very similar nomenclature in our industry, which is helpful to us, right? Um, we don't need to reinvent the wheel here, which is why this book also has a glossary. We want you to use the same terms. We want you to use the same acronyms. And since some of you are government, you have acronyms I will never keep up with. But on the concrete side, I try. Um, and we also make sure that we're up to date on industry standards. So this includes not only a long list of AASHTO and long list of ASTM standards. It shows which ones are harmonized, which a lot are, more than people realize. And we try to keep up to date on that because it's helpful. Um, but it also includes uh, the CORE's list of standards as well. And then um, we do look to our northern friends. Um, the Canadians have a very small association that does things on a high-end durability side. So we do look to them for durability provisions. They tend to get things done about five to 10 years ahead of us in the States. It's not because Canadians move quicker. They really don't necessarily move any faster than us. They stop at Tim Hortons for coffee and donuts. Um, but there's less of them, so they're sitting in a room getting things passed a little quicker than we do on our standard side. And as long as safety and the uh, health and welfare of our uh, users of concrete are considered, we do tend to adopt their standards about five years later. Um, and then there are many industry associations mentioned in design and control beyond just PCA, obviously ACI and ASTM and AASHTO, but um, many others that you may need. There's great references out there, usable tools for you that are throughout the document. So let's talk about some of the updates. Um, there's a fundamentals chapter. It gives you information on how much concrete is made and and what the markets are and all that information. It explains the beginning of time and the Colosseum. And if you're into uh, Pazuli and, and volcanic ash, it gets into that. But <clears throat> without getting into all that, one of my favorite things that we did, because there wasn't much to do during the pandemic otherwise, so I really focused on this book, um, <clears throat> was update. And I know you can't see it. Um, but uh, it was to update the timeline of significant PCA research and its impact on concrete and on concrete durability and strength. So going from the early 1900s all the way to 2020, it highlights research reports and gives you the link. There's an ebook version of this available too, that you can go straight to the PCA library and as nerds get these reports that back the information that we already know. So if you're worried about some particular property or something about concrete, we have backup information for you. And if you're one of those people who doesn't believe that what we did in the 50s pertains to 2022, uh, my answer for you as a former consultant and for the consultants as a room, it depends. It may relate, it may need a little modification, and I'd be happy to talk that out with you because a lot of this is the fundamentals of how concrete reacts. On the cement side, we're evolving. We're going to talk more about that this afternoon. Um, but really, we want people to understand why cements change. 
and we're not trying to upset you. You are the ones who are asking for it. You're asking for higher strengths at early ages. You're asking for quicker set times. You're asking for sustainability. And so those are the reasons that our materials evolve. Um, and then, of course, logistically, uh, other things may change on the supplementary or alternative cementitious side. So one thing this book does is get people familiar with the fact that cement isn't something you dig out of the ground and go put into concrete. You have to manufacture it. And that's a high-end, uh, very sophisticated uh, process that you're throwing an oven up to 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit to make a hydraulic material that makes a durable product. Yes, that gives off CO2 as well. Um, but in that process, we can take and make it a very energy efficient process. So the book highlights some of those uh, huge changes in our uh, manufacturing process, but also changes in the types of cement that are produced today. There's not just one shade of gray. There's many different amounts of iron in cement, but there's also different applications. And so you may be asking for high early, uh, depending on other locations of the country that uh, some of you may delve into, you might have sulfates, you might have uh, significant sulfates if you go out west, um, and then for freeze-thaw, you might be doing some smaller repair style maintenance and be using packaged products that would be air and trained ahead of time. Usually this is done through chemical admixtures. Um, and then we do hit in a separate chapter on supplementary cementing materials, but those standards are changing too. For years, we confused the heck out of our industry. We told everyone that what matters for fly ash is the silica and alumina content. We didn't mean it. We were just kidding. The whole time we meant calcium content by measuring the silica and alumina content in the standard. So it was the messiest uh, description, and now it's based on calcium content. If you're above 18%, you're up to 18 to 30 as a sea ash and less than 18. But now it's getting even more confusing because depending on your coal sources, you're probably blending coals and you probably have a combination. It's not about if it's bituminous or subbituminous, and you really just need to get over it. What you want to know is how much calcium is in this SCM and how that impacts its posilinacy. So is it a hydraulic material or is it posilonic? Why do you care? Because when you woke up this morning, you were thinking about calcium hydroxide and how much silica was available to bond to it to make calcium silicate hydrate, the beautiful gel that some people call wow. mud, that gives us our strength and durability. That's how we get durable concrete. So this kind of stuff is important to us. And the most important takeaway is if you're going to substitute something, which is what you guys are dealing with right now and what we'll talk more about this afternoon, if you're going to use a new material, what does that do to your concrete? How does it impact its properties? Well, it is different. If you change the paste, it's not just going to feel different to the contractors that are closing the surface. It's going to act different in setting times and strength gains, but we can mess with mixed designs to get that all to equal out, too. You don't need to freak out. Um, but we do need to be aware that they're different. And also that there's many more materials coming. There are many other alternative cementitious materials coming about, and one of them that is a new standard that you should be aware of is ASTM 1866 for uh, ground glass. Whether it's uh, soda glass or it's fiberglass, this product is being used mostly on the research side, mostly at college level, um, but it is advancing. There are a few companies that are out there um, that are putting it into practice as well. And what does that mean for the future of cementitious ingredients? It means it'll be more prevalent. What does that mean for us? Well, we just have to be aware that glass, we have to make sure it's not silicious and doesn't impact our ASR. Um, so we, we want to make sure it's the right product and that it's meeting this minimum bar of ASTM C1866 and not just throwing in uh, other products that could react poorly with our concrete. On the chemical admixture side, um, there is a new admixture every day, and we don't have to be disappointed in that. It's answering a hurdle that we needed to answer. So back in my day, because that's fun to say at my age now, back in my day, you know, those naphthalenes and melamines, boy, did they give us slump loss. But now we have these mid-range water reducers that span the gap and help us with slump loss. And if you were the one that was out there making sure that that concrete was workable at a less than three inch slump 
and was placeable and closable, that would be something to consider. Mid-ranges answer a lot of our hurdles, but so do other chemical admixtures. It doesn't mean everyone's perfect. Sometimes there's a new kid on the block trying to be cool that hasn't quite met its grade, and so we have to make sure these are properly vetted materials and they meet the minimums of ASTM and AASHTO to be used in concrete. So innovation's great, but minimum bars are great too. Um, and what we did in this chapter is we worked on mechanisms um, to make sure that you kind of understand the principles. Why would you use this? Uh, how does it impact other properties of concrete? So uh, my favorite admixture being from a cold tundra, uh, this accent is Wisconsinite, it's not Chicago. Um, <clears throat> what, what, uh, what we care about mostly is air and how much fun it is to control physics. You'll get air, but will you get enough? Will it stay stable? Are you gonna keep it in the whole time? Do you use it for free stall or do you use it for economy? Is it helping you with workability? So this gets into some of those properties and ranges of dosages and, and things that might be important to you there. Same with the differences between our old school water reducers and our current uh, polycarboxylate technology, which isn't just one. There's thousands of different chains of that product that can help us with uh, water reduction and um, releasing that uh, trapped water in cement. And then whether you're using any type of set modifier, uh, accelerator or retarder, how that works with uh, cement chemistry. So yes, there is chemistry in this book as well. On the durability side, I think uh, most of us are aware of what we're trying to design for, for exposure classes uh, for paving. But really on the ACI side, um, they keep changing the letters on you and they keep changing the strengths. The most important takeaway on durability is the strength is mostly insignificant, except in freeze thaw because hydraulic pressures of ice expanding water is uh, pretty significant. And if you don't believe me, leave a beer in your freezer tonight and then curse me when you go get it in the morning. Um, and then uh, the other thing to consider is abrasion resistance. So if you guys are worried about wear and tear of your surfaces of your pavements, then the compression strength actually is a higher factor than even the quality of your aggregates. So um, that, that plays a huge role. But on the other side, if you guys had a marine climate or anywhere that uh, might bring salt water or sulfates in, that would play a large role in your overall design of that pavement as well. For the most part, I wouldn't think you're designing for either of those around here. But this uh, at PCA is a, a very important topic to us because most people who go to school for structural engineering and civil engineering don't know anything about concrete durability, unless that was their professor's favorite topic. Um, so this doesn't get taught as much as it needs to in colleges, and it, it tends to be a consulting topic instead. Um, and then another topic that is coming into classrooms and really needs to come into more offices is sustainability. And what we all need to do when working with concrete is overcome the bias that we're the bad guy. We're not the bad guy, we're the solution. The real thing that you have to realize is that everyone has to count what your carbon footprint is. And I'm not talking about the two flights that I took to get here, which is part of it, or how much hairspray I used, which is part of it, and the fact that my coffee came in a styrofoam cup, which is part of it. We could talk about all that all day, um, but what we also want to talk about is construction. And the important thing with getting to carbon neutrality in concrete construction isn't just the footprint of the one ton of CO2 per ton of cement that we acknowledge. It's a hydraulic material. We have to make it hydraulic. Um, it's the fact that we use so much of it. So much concrete is used is why we have a stigma. But it's used for a reason. It's used because it's durable. It's used because it's resilient. What we need to do is start looking at the whole life cycle, looking at it from the first use of the material, which starts with clinker from the kiln, as to the type of cement we blend, to the type of uh, life cycle that it has in service and what its carbonation point is. Because most of your pavements are going to carbonate approximately 10% over their lifespan. If you design that pavement for 75 years, and several pavements in the United States did last that long, um, even though they were probably designed for 25 or 40 years. Uh, we have to look at life cycles and we have to start designing for that whole 
footprint and, and be able to equate that. And this afternoon we'll talk a little bit more about some of that impact we can do with selection of materials. Um, on the mixed design side, there are many things we could talk about, but really on, on the book, The Design and Control, what we focus on is the good old fashioned absolute volume mixed design for those newbies in our industry. So someone can teach them how to make a cubic yard of concrete. Now, if you're a ready mix person, uh, which there are a few around, to do that, <coughs> they're doing it based on field history, three-point curves, and trial batching. They're not um, out there tweaking their mixes with anything but a wonderful computer program that's already figured out their history records. Um, but from a starting point, it's great to have a methodology. And I've been teaching mixed design for over 20 years. So it's, it's really important to drive home show them where they can make changes, show them where the tweaks are allowed, where different material substitutions matter. And so this chapter really gets into that um, as well as the simple math of proportioning. Um, on the batching and mixing side, really what you're honed in on here is ASTM C94. Um, as a show of hands, who woke up this morning thinking about that standard? When's the last time you read it? I would love to tell you it hasn't changed. It changes every six months, actually. Uh, ready mix operations aren't necessarily highly sophisticated. We need, we need to recycle as much material as we can, um, but really where the, the importance comes is what materials are going in that truck and what's its shearing action for mixing speed and agitation speed and how long are you gonna let that beautiful product of concrete sit in that trunk before you give it to the person who bought it. Um, so it's a transportation, it's a delivery, and, and there is a bit of ordering the mixture as well, but there's also tolerances in here. And those tolerances change the yield if we didn't have batch weight tolerances, if we didn't have uh, scale and measure tolerances in here. Um, but also on the ordering side, uh, most people order in a combination. Uh, rarely is an engineer only designating strength. They also usually designate either cement content or slump or something that's probably not what they should be in control of. Um, and, and what we really look at is if, if you're type B, you better know how to do a mixed design. If you're using a cookie cutter mix from one of your historical projects, know that it works in 2022 with your locally available materials. Um, I know that when something works, you wanna keep doing it but as our materials evolve, we wanna make sure that we're not restricting a producer to something that they could do better for you as well. And then um, often we're just uh, doing a little bit of both where, where we're asking for um, limits on cement content for sustainability, or you might have minimum cement contents because you think you're making your concrete more durable. But again, my job's not to sell you cement, it's to make concrete turn out. So I want to make sure you're using the right amount for that application. Um, so some changes in C94 that you should be very aware of uh, because they do impact day-to-day -day rejection of trucks, which is always fun. Um, and in a former life, my hat was much whiter and my boots were really spray painted with something. Um, but we had a debate for about five years on discharge time at C94. And I rarely use an, lose an argument, but um, <clears throat> I lost this one. So. Uh, I used to say I will outlive you as well, but as I've aged, I've stopped saying that. Because um, <clears throat> there's some youngins too. So with that said, do we care how long it takes concrete to be delivered? Yes, why? You guys are whispering, you don't have to whisper. Slump loss, air loss, quality of concrete. What do we measure the quality of concrete on in the field? Slump and temperature and sometimes air if you're out there with the air bucket. Um, is that enough? Does that tell you peak temperature rise? Not really. So, so my issues aren't slump and temperature, which are important. My issue is temperature rise and when that concrete's gonna wake up on you. So my real question is, when is initial set? And that's a question I get every day at PCA. Ma'am, I have a six bag mix, when's it gonna set? Um, it depends, is your answer as consultants. Your answer should, everything should be, it depends. Um, but it, it really isn't something you can easily answer unless you know, is it 20 degrees out? Is it 80 degrees out? Will it be both those temperatures today? Uh, this is North Dakota, so I'm sure the answer there is yes as well. Um, so they changed it. They felt that 90 minutes was not tied to concrete in 2022. 
What it was tied to is concrete in 1950s that was between 60 and 80 degrees Fahrenheit on a given day at a water cement ratio of approximately 0.5. Is that concrete in 2022? Not necessarily. There's a lot of concrete that sets up in a half an hour, 40 minutes is paved. There's a lot of concrete that takes three hours to set, initial set I'm talking, not final set. And I agree that 90 minutes isn't an answer, but it covers us. It's a CYA spec with the 90. You need a default. But also, C94 is a spec that's meant to be a, a trucking company spec. It's about delivery. Of, you, you want your truck back. You got to fill it again. So if you're a contractor of a different type of concrete paving, it's probably not our issue. You're often right next door with your mixture. Um, but you deliver and you want your truck for three hours, that's going to change up logistics. But it's also going to concern me when a bunch of homeowners' driveways don't turn out because people abuse the spec. So I'm slightly concerned, but all my really good friends promised me their default's still 90 minutes, so I, my whole thing is, what's the point? Um, but if you want to make extended set concrete, it's absolutely possible. We have extended set modifiers. If you want to make ready-mix concrete that, that has to set in half an hour, you can do that as well. That's what chemical admixtures do. So um, cement chemistry is, is very important, and we can modify it. Um, so this is something that went away. It concerns me. I'll be keeping an eye on it, um, but I don't win every year. This one concerns me less. This one's been around forever, too. What's our default drum revolution? 70. That's mixing time, but that was a very good answer. Um, 70 is your default mixing revolutions. And our default for a maximum number of revolutions, it was 300. So 70 is still there. We still need thorough mixing. And then you can be an agitation over if you're the driver that doesn't like your drum to turn. You just drive it without turning it until you get to the site. Um, but once, uh, once you hit a maximum number of revolutions, that truck is supposed to be rejected. So with this, <coughs> we let go of the 300 because it was based on a specific friable aggregate that they feel is rarely used. And uh, they did a lot of research at NRMCA and others. And this was the least of my worries. And what cracks me up the most are people that actually thought 300 revolutions was tied to 90 minutes um, because there's lots of drums that don't move. So this is, this is not something I will lose sleep over. I would like to talk long and hard about that time limit and what your expectations are. So, um, But purchasers can waive these limits. So as the owner's reps think about it, it doesn't have to be 90. Just tell them what you really want and be very clear on it. And just realize you're going to have to pay for it, too, if you ask for it to set quicker or if you ask for it to last longer. Um, and then again, and I, have a, I look like a control freak. I'm actually not. I relax a lot. Um, but I also allow water additions on site. Um, and that's something I give a three hour talk at World of Concrete. And my, my cliff notes are yes, yes, you can do it. And the only way you can do it is if you don't exceed the water cement ratio. How do you know? How do you know if you've exceeded the water cement ratio? It says it on some batch tickets, sir. It's not a requirement of C94, but that was an excellent answer. That's where the answer should be. Um, so require it to be on the batch ticket as the orderer of the concrete. And then make sure that your slump's not exceeded as well and that you get your proper mixing time of an extra 30 um, number of revolutions. The other thing we recently changed in C94 was that we um, require this as well for retempering with water reducers. So it's not allowed for partial loads. Everyone should know that. But um, it also limits the additions of super plasticizer. There's a maximum amount of that as well. So something to consider. All right, and I mentioned there's a new chapter of imperfections. What I want you to go to bed tonight and not worry about is that sometimes it is just an imperfection. It's just a blemish. We all have them. Not everything's pretty. There are a few rust spots in my driveway that drive me nuts because I know we have iron ore in the Chicago area that rusts and it irks me. Is there anything wrong with my driveway? No, it's beautiful. It just has some rust stains that I will clean eventually. I'm timing it out because they'll come back. Um, if I had bug holes, I find them aesthetically pleasing as well. You may not. Um, but sometimes they turn to surface defects. And those might be delaminations, those might be deep honeycombs, 
those might be cracks that become structural. And so we really need to be able to weigh the difference and this chapter will help you with that and give you some recommended repair strategies. And on the hot and cold side, we haven't really changed or modified concrete temperatures. They're all over the place. What we're recommending you stop doing is using this psychometric chart. It doesn't really match concretes of 2022 that we used to say, if you're over 0.2 pounds, then you better start fogging. You know what, if you don't have bleed, you better start fogging. And that's not the time to go find that hose. You should be well ahead of that curve. And you should be um, estimating your concrete's temperature and temperature rise based on some calculations, which are easy in a computer and more difficult when you look at that type of formula. Um, but what really matters is temperature rise. And that's what we drive home with on, on the design and control, is to measure your temperature rise of your internal temperature of your concrete and the exterior and monitor it. We're pushing for more maturity testing. We're pushing for mo monitoring concrete temperatures and protecting concrete temperatures. That's how you get successful concrete, is curing it and providing the temperature you need. And then lastly, on the paving side, we haven't forgotten about you. Um, it's just we know there's lots of other resources out there. Uh, so all the paving design stuff really comes from ACPA and other uh, older PCA resources that are referenced. But what we do have on the PCA side that you should be aware of are specific cement-based applications of roller compacted concrete and soil cement. So if you have any need for that information, it's in the chapter on paving, but also in many other resources that we have available for you. And then the most important takeaway here is there's always more than one way to answer your question. So tell me what you need, and I'll tell you all your options, and then we'll talk budget. Um, but really, the important part of having something like design and control as a reference manual is to have something in writing for you to answer your questions and answer your customers' questions as well. So it's meant to be a reference manual. It's meant to be a resource for you, and I encourage you to check it out. I'll leave you with that. I stole one of those books because we we had somebody answer a question. Who was that over here? Come on up and grab a grab a book. They weigh approximately six and a half pounds because the paper is high quality. <laughs> well, thank you, Michelle. This was very insightful. We're uh, very happy to have the author of uh, the updated book here. Michelle will be around uh, this evening or through the rest of the afternoon and at the social tonight. Uh, I'll help her carry those books out to one of the tables out there. So if you have a question, uh, feel free to ask her, and uh, you might be able to take home, a, take home a book. Right now, to keep things on time, we're going to take about an eight-minute break, and then we'll be back in this room with uh, sessions on pavement smoothness and grinding, and then how to read a concrete batch ticket. So give yourself about eight minutes and come back in and see us. Thank you. <laughs>